This podcast is made possible by your support and your donations. Thank you. And by the purchase of my book called Everyday Buddhism, Real Life Buddhist Teachings and Practices for Real Change. I will post an affiliate link to the book on Amazon in the show notes. And if you've already read it, please take a minute to rate and review and also consider purchasing it again for a friend or family member as a gift. Welcome to Everyday Buddhism, making every day better by applying the proven tools found in Buddhist concepts. Welcome to Episode 75 of Everyday Buddhism, making every day better. In this episode, I talk with Jack Wynn. Jack is a first-generation immigrant who came to America after the Vietnam War. While both of his parents are serious practitioners of Buddhism, Jack didn't find his own path until his mid-twenties. He spent 10 years exploring the Insight Vipassana tradition, but it wasn't until meeting Sone Rinpoche that he found his spiritual home. In the last 10 years, he has taken retreats with notable teachers such as Khandro Rinpoche, Mingyur Rinpoche, Anam Tupton, and he is currently working on his Nundro in the Dujon Tursar, uh, Tirsar lineage. While at a retreat at Spirit Rock more than 20 years ago, though, he had a thought. It was a seed to visually explore Buddhism through the lens of lay practitioners. That seed was planted and it has since expanded from his original goal, which is still in his mind, original goal of creating a coffee table book, to include more of a multimedia presentation in the form of a website, which you can currently explore. With the array of resources available to learn about Buddhism as a practice and religion, the purpose of Jack's project was not to educate so much about the tenets of Buddhism, uh, history of Buddhism, and so forth, but to explore Buddhist practice through the lens of lay practitioners. On his website, you will find a broad survey of practitioners across social and economic backgrounds, geography, identity types, lineages, and stages of development. And you can explore real-life stories of practitioners' challenges and successes in integrating ancient Buddhist practices in today's multicultural world. As he relays in the upcoming episode, the inspiration for this project, which can be experienced on his website at beyondthecushion.com, that's all one word strung together, beyondthecushion.com, came through his own experience of embracing Buddhism in America. The end goal of this project is still a coffee table book, which Jack hopes to have success publishing so that he may donate the profits to Sone Nepal nuns and dedicate the project to all his teachers and especially to his root teacher, Sone Rinpoche. I know you will enjoy exploring his website, Jack's website, beyondthecushion.com, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. The conversation starts now. Good afternoon, Jack. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Good afternoon, Wendy. Thanks for having me. really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. I'm excited about this. I'm excited about your project, by the way. I, I shared a bit about you a little bit in the project on my introduction, um, but I'd like to know a little bit more about you in your own words, not just what I saw on your website and what you've told me ahead of time. Um, you A little bit about you in your own words and sort of what inspired 
this project beyond the cushion. Um, if you could just, you know, feel free to ramble on however it comes to you. And uh, if you could just share a little bit of the personal story behind you and the project. Sure. I'd love to, Wendy. Yeah, I think, you know, for me, um, the project seed was sort of planted 20 years ago. Um, but before that, I think there's a little history of why that seed sort of was planted years ago. Um, as a, you know, uh, as an immigrant that came to, uh, to America when I was about five years old uh, from the Vietnam War, um, you know, both my parents were Buddhist practitioners. Um, and so, so I was obviously exposed to Buddhism when I was young. Um, and, but at the same time, they, when they were practicing in America, um, you know, it was around, you know, the, the community and sort of festivals and sort of, sort of the rituals of sort of what a community might look like. Uh, but as sort of as a young child being assimilated in the West, I obviously wasn't really interested in religion and, and <laughs> sort, of the, sort, of the, sort of the things that what my parents were doing. And so that was sort of my exposure to Buddhism, you know, when I was young. And obviously, you know, how Buddhism sort of took place uh, in America with sort of the Asian communities was something that I was aware of. But uh, as I got older, um, you know, I went to college and, and, uh, and uh, you know, and the, in, and the sort of the, in, the curiosity uh, was sort of exposed through, um, you know, reading Eastern uh, philosophy, basically. Um, you know, I was really, uh, you know, sort of struck by Tao Te Ching, the Stephen Mitchell um, sort of translation. And that really, you know, sort of really resonated with me. And by chance, I, um, you know, I found a, a copy of Senju, uh, Senju Ruki's Beginner's Mind, uh, like right at the end of, of college. And that was sort of the most sort of formal introduction to Buddhism. And, and again, it really struck a chord uh, with me in terms of the intellectual appeal of, you know, sort of really understanding, you know, my world and things like that. I have always been sort of uh, someone that I really appreciate, understand the big picture. I study economics in college and I really, you know, having an understanding of the big picture kind of was important to me. And obviously, you know, the philosophy behind Buddhism and, and, and things like that was appealing from that perspective in, in terms of my personality. Um, and so that was sort of an introduction to the intellectual aspect of Buddhism. But, you know, I was really grateful and fortunate to be in the Bay Area uh, where I went to school. Um, and I was sort of obviously had a lot of access to the Buddha Dharma in the West, um, you know, um, particularly, um, you know, I took my first retreat at Spirit Rock, um, you know, I sort of, they have a young adult program uh, back then. And so I took a, you know, retreat there. And that's really where, you know, for me, the meditation practice really solidified my interest in Buddhism in terms of really showing sort of the power of a sort of a meditative state and sort of the richness of what an experience might look like through meditation. And so for, you know, for a good five, 10 years, I, you know, went on a, a number of retreats at Spirit Rock with different themes, different teachers, um, and was, you know, obviously wanted to, to, to deepen my practice through, through meditation. Uh, but, you know, and, and, and actually it was at Spirit Rock um, that, that that seed of this project was planted. Uh, I had just, um, was during, uh, I mean, I, I think that time frame was about two, uh, 2000, 2001, mm -hmm. when, um, and I was part of the dot com boom in the Bay Area, right? And, uh, and and I was sort of pivoting my career. I was a software engineer uh, during the sort of the dot com boom, and I was sort of at a retreat, and I was sort of migrating to being a photographer at that time. And the seed of really exploring Buddhism through a visual form, being a photographer, sort of was sort of planted in my in, in sort of in my mind stream. And then, really, I think for me. Um, my own struggle, I think, in the journey was also more sort of motivation to really keep that sort of seed fertilized, so to speak. I mean, I think for me, uh, the struggle of finding a community, the struggle of finding a lineage, the struggle of really figuring out how to navigate the Dharma in the West, being an Asian a person of Asian descent. You know, a lot of times when I had gone to, you know, Spirit Rock and some of these other communities, <clears throat> it was not always, it was, you know, the, the, the ethnicities and, and sort of the social classes was not always consistent, reflective of my own experience. And so right. I think that struggle of uh, really seeing the Dharma uh, and also kind of thinking about my own experience and trying to fit in was, again, more sort of uh, 
lot more sort of more fertilizing for me to kind of explore the project. And so, so you know, for 10 to 15 years, again, you know, through that practice, um, you know, I kind of left, left that project sort of, sort of, for, uh, sort of fermenting, for, so to speak. <laughs> and only in the past five years, uh, I decided, you know, I was sort of basically at a point in my life where there was a lot of life changes. And I felt like I was sort of stuck in, in sort of like, you know, in my period where, and I still sometimes feel that where, you know, you, you know, you're living a very grateful, you're living a very rich life in the Bay Area, having access to everything and sort of, sort of the golden handcuffs of really, you know, a, lux <laughs> yeah. a luxurious lifestyle. And it was hard to kind of give up, but at the same time, I knew I kind of had reached the end of my rope of really feeling that, you know, even though I had a practice, a meditation practice for the 10, 15 years, I was sort of beginning to hit sort of the ceiling of, okay, this is not getting to where I want to be. I didn't have a teacher. I didn't have a community. I've been practicing on my own. Um, and, and I felt like, you know, I wanted to make a, a shift around that. And so, so I actually did a, a vision quest uh, as part of sort of this inward sort of midlife crisis <laughs> sort of <laughs> struggle. And then in part and in the vision quest and actually another and, and some other sort of sources really compel me to really say, okay, you know, you've had this project in the back of your mind for a long time. You know, you really need to start it now. And so through the vision quest, through other influences, I felt like I was okay, now given all these things, it was time for me to pick up the project and really start sort of really start doing it. And so that was again about four or five years ago. Um, so that's sort of how the project sort of was planted and, and it grew over time in terms of really in terms of how I was approaching the project. Obviously, as a photographer, my initial thought was actually just to produce a coffee book of really what Buddhism looked like in terms of, you know, sort of the social, what the practitioners look like and to really explore it from a visual coffee book style uh, you know, sort of um, right. perspective, but but at the same time, as I got deeper into the project, I was as I was talking to people preparing for the project, I felt like the stories they were telling me about their practice and really, you know, how they were telling it was really a, really a meaningful part of this journey, and I felt like I needed to capture that, and so I started to expand to have more videos in terms of spending <coughs> most of the of the interviews in a video format where. I usually go to people's home, set up, you know, an interview and really go through some of the themes of what their practice might look like. Because, you know, when I started the book, I felt like there was a lot of, you know, the Dharma, the teachers, all that was pretty accessible in this day and age. And so I didn't want another have another book about sort of the Dharma from the teaching, from a teaching right. perspective, or right. from a lay perspective of actually how are people interpreting the teachings? How are they integrating the teachings? And so that's really where the personal stories uh, of that was more important to the project than really, again, the teachings themselves. Because I felt like, you know, I, part of, you know, part of, of my interest into that was also, uh, you know, my lack of own spiritual friends. These are the questions I would have in my own journey. You know, I was like, again, right. I was part of a couple of different sanghas, but I just never felt like, you know, when you go to a retreat or you go to a song, you, know, you talk about pretty lightweight things. And, you know, and then I felt like, you know, this was the opportunity for me to ask really deeper questions about people's practice and how to integrate. And that way, you know, I felt like it could be it was beneficial to me, obviously. But I felt like I'm sure there are other people in the journey that have these type of questions about what does lineage look like? How, what is the impact? And so that so those were some of the questions that really drove the project in terms of, you know, what are some of the themes that I wanted to explore? What are the kind of people that I want to include in the project? Um, and so that's kind of um, where I'm at now in terms of, you know, it's still, you know, I still want to produce a coffee book. And obviously, you know, the goal of the coffee book is 108 portraits. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so that's sort of my first milestone, but at the same time, um, you know, obviously I, want, I have expanded to, you know, other types of, mediums where I felt like I want to make this resource as, as accessible as possible to as many people. And that's why yeah, I felt like the website and having interviews there and yeah. having a way for people to navigate that is not necessarily linear, 
based their their own background, based on their own interests, was important to the project. So that I, you know, I spent a lot of time um, work on the pro on the website and things like that to kind of make it accessible to anybody that was interested. Uh, beyond sort of eventually obviously there'll be a book but you know you have to purchase a book or pay for a movie <laughs> right. so that was some of my intention of really making it accessible so that you know it benefits as many people as possible well that's a <laughs> what a what a wonderful story and uh, there's a lot there so let's unpack some of it okay um sure. <laughs> the first thing that i need to know is you said you had that seed even from like your it, one of your first retreats you had that seed what was that seed it was i mean what what did it what did it what was it you know what 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 formed in your mind what what did you think oh i I'd, <laughs> I'd like to know more about how all these people practice or what was that seed i think the seed was definitely well, part of the seed was sort of my frustration i think i feel like you know in terms of going to retreat retreats and not having a sense of able to have conversations around yeah. sort of spiritual practice because you know when i go retreat you know spirit rock was silent for like you know 98 percent of the time <laughs> you right. know, the star teaching. <laughs> and so you know the last you know half you know last hour you could talk with them like okay everybody's going away so i was like okay this is a little bit frustrating to me really share this very rich experience but not able to kind of dig deeper into that. And again, I didn't have a local sangha in my where I went on a regular basis. I was still sort of exploring lineages at that time. Right. I started in the Vipassana insight uh, lineage with you know with Jack Cornfield and, and all those teachers there. But actually, um, once I got introduced to Tibetan Buddhism to uh, through Soking Rinpoche, I was sort of start pivoting and trying to find sort of you know. Tibetan sanghas in the Bay Area, and I, and I was going to different sanghas and things like that. Figure out okay, which sangha was, and even in that during that time, I was still struggling to kind of feel like okay, what lineage was right for me? What oh, you know, yeah. so there's all these sort of like questions that I had that, and I didn't just I didn't have a sort of a spiritual community where I could ask these questions, and so all these sort of challenges that I experienced through my own journey was definitely sort of amplify my motivation to, to, to really, you know, work on the project. But again, I think that seed, again, was really my own struggle and not sure. having spiritual friends to kind of really learn from what that journey might look like. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because um, I can only imagine what it would be like from an Asian perspective or because um, I I ex I practice in a Japanese Mahayana tradition, although I practice mm -hmm. for years in the Tibetan tradition, similar to you in a, in a local Sangha mm -hmm. and, and then taking teachings with people from other Sanghas. Um, so I have both the Tibetan experience and the Japanese Mahayana experience. But I did know I know that, you know, in first generation Buddhists like your parents, Parents were. It's like then the 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 you know the children of first generation uh, Buddhists are like heck no I don't want anything to do with this <laughs> uh, you know it it just seems and it, I mean, it's it's similar to I think a lot of uh, Americans who brought up in, in certain Christian traditions you know mm -hmm. they you know they they have this sort of inherited religion and then you know by the time when they hit you know you know in their teens they're like you know they can't get far enough away from it so but I I do know that and I think a lot of people People might not understand this if they're not didn't try to uh, experience Buddha Dharma in their own lives. Don't know how it can be a little lonely unless you've hooked up with a sangha that you regularly attend because retreats are like this, especially if they're based on meditation. You're right, mostly the time you're you're silent. Then they, then you might have a little you know tea and cookies afterwards and then everybody splits right and so so yeah you don't really get to compare notes or 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 you know there is some kind of loneliness to it in that that you think am i doing this right um am i thinking the right way about these teachings you know all those things i i definitely get that so that was kind of brilliant of you to think of this because it's like i 
this part, I don't know of anything else like this around it. I mean, I, I'm not familiar with anything that I've seen like what you have. Um, and unless I hope people, ex- you know, check out your website, um, even maybe even before they listen to this interview or listen to the interview and then go back <laughs> and check out the website and listen mm-hmm. again, because it's so fascinating. Um, uh you know, you you traveled the country, from what I understand, interviewing mm-hmm. practitioners, and and um, and how many people so far have you interviewed? I've been about forty five to fifty people. I've, I've, yeah, yeah. So I'm still kind of the first couple of rounds were like test interviews, and so I didn't, yeah. I'm not that was a beta anymore. test. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so they were like close friends and things like that. And I, I wasn't, and I was really more focused on the photography. Uh, but yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at right now. And I think obviously part of the challenge is as I interview more people, I have to become, I have to become more selective because I, I want to have as many different points of views, people from, you know, different geography, different, you know, lineages and things like that. So it's been more and more challenging to find sort of the, you know, sort of a different point of view as I kind of, as I get deeper into the project. Um, I also want to just share one other thing that I think is uh, uh, sort of a, a challenge of the Buddha Dharma in the West, I think, and this is what I experienced too, being in the Bay Area where th- it was very rich in spirit, having a lot of spiritual traditions, and that was sort of the challenge of having too many choices, right? Because it was like, <laughs> if I was, I, when I was, if I was in a small town with one Sangha, I probably would have been just, that would have been it, but I think the fact that there were so many in the Bay Area, I just didn't know how to commit and really didn't have a way to kind of navigate, you know, the lineages, the, you know, the points of the teacher and the sangha. Because I, I was sort of shopping for, okay, a sangha a teacher. But at the same time, because there was so much in the Bay Area, I learned that, you know, it was, you know, sort of detrimental because I just, you know, didn't come in. And I think this is typical of having too much access in the West too. And so I think that is something that I feel like with my own experience, I, you know, again, being exposed to the Buddha Dharma, to the med- mostly meditation retreats, again, I didn't really appreciate sort of having a local sangha either. Yeah, but there's also the other side of it, and I've experienced this a lot, is, is mm-hmm. people who live in the middle of the country um and not not always in the middle of the country different states have and, and cities and have no local sanghas or none close to them and so mm-hmm. so and i get this all the time i you know i started a virtual sangha as a spin off from my podcast because mm-hmm. so many people reached out to me saying they they were writing to me from my podcast i don't I, there's nothing near me i don't have a sangha mm-hmm. I, how can i practice blah 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 you know and um yeah. or there is a local sangha near me and it's a vietnamese temple and i don't understand yeah. any of it or, <laughs> or 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 it's a it's a tibetan sangha and all those yeah. pictures of scary buddhas scare me and i don't understand why i would want to go there and and or or how do I go to these things? Cause I don't know how to, do I bow? I don't want to bow, you, you know? And so people were asking those questions yeah. and, and it's like, there's a lot of people are really lost, especially if they've got nothing locally. And, and mm-hmm. in some ways I think, and I don't know if you've experienced this at all, because I don't know how active you are in your project at, over the course of the pandemic. Um, but, mm-hmm. but um all of a sudden, a whole bunch of sanghas appeared online because they had to, mm-hmm. and yeah, they, yeah, they yeah. probably didn't even know how to do it. And and then they mm-hmm. then they became online. And what I found in talking to people is more and more people uh, were able to experiment with different schools, lineage, mm-hmm. teachers, and find out things. Uh, that they that they would have never had that opportunity to do based on where their geographic area. So, and so I'm sure in your you found have you run across people who like didn't know you know in their experience in their background like they didn't have a sangha didn't know where to go there was nothing in their local community. Did you have did you have that experience in in your interviews or? Were they all rich with sanghas like you? <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not the case. I think it was, it's, a, it's a spectrum 
of, you know, and, I, and I'll say, I, you know, the people I, I tend to interview are pretty committed practitioners. I, you know, so I think, you know, being able to share your practice and, and being authentic is typically people that have engaged in the practice for a while. Obviously, there's a lot. And so I think they had a sort of foundation, you know, we didn't in a small community, they were part of the Sangha. Right. Um, because I mean, I, so, you know, so I definitely have put out the word and some people come back, I'm not part of a Sangha or I, I run, you know, and so I've been sort of wary of just trying to be mindful of, you know, does this person, does this, is this person's story unique or is it going to be more typical of, and so right. those are some things I had to consider if it makes sense because, um, because again, I, I don't want to necessarily, you know, because with limited resources and things like that, you know, I want to make it so that, so that, you know, the people that are being interviewed have some sort of common denominator where, okay, this is not such a special case where, you know, there are definitely people that, you know, are very gifted and, and, and have very powerful teachers, but at the same time, most people's experience are not going to be having that. And so I want to have uh, you know interview people that are uh typical in a sense of okay they're in some community that have some lineage that is kind con god is well known and obviously i've interviewed people from other lesser known lineages like triratna or the one buddhism and things like that but at the same time i also been mindful of just okay i don't want to get too esoteric with the project because really you know with the book you know i have this idea that it's going to be more of a you know it's not going to be sort of delineated the way de that I've broken down the website in terms of breaking people up by, you know, the, the, uh, the different lineages that are available, whether it's Theravada and Varjana. I feel like with the book, it needs to be that these are all sort of practitioners. You don't need to look at them from a, you know, whether it's Zen or Tibetan, right? And so I wanted to make it more generalized. And so that's really where, um, you know, obviously if they're more curious, then they could go to the website to kind the of learn website, more about right. what does what the lineage means and, and all this kind of things but really the book is going to be you know more generalized in terms of what practice looks like beyond meditation and things like that yeah you know i noticed that you did have this this unique uh format as a platform for your website like it's mm -hmm. like a three times three kind of thing it's the it's the three, yeah <laughs> it's, the, it's the three schools and uh the three stages i think like beginning practitioner is that right yeah is that how yes. you did it mid, yeah. mid, mid practice mm -hmm. season practitioner and then what was the other one um the three, uh, the three jewels, like the Buddha. Oh, the Buddha Dharma Saga. Saga. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, that was it. That was an interesting thing. What made you decide that is just some way to 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 strategize the architecture of the site or, or what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was definitely, you know, I had a, a map in terms of all the different themes I, I wanted to interview. But it was, it was a little bit too big. And I felt like, okay, within, um, you know, because I started out with just trying to map all these different things, but I didn't, I couldn't figure out how to organize it. And so that was yeah. a struggle for a couple of years. And so I felt at one point last year, I said, okay, I want to make it so that, you know, most of the questions I'm asking are around nine themes versus like 30 themes. Because <laughs> yes, it's, sort of like, <laughs> it's sort of like, from a sort of logistics point of view, okay. And so that's kind of why I felt like it was, you know, these are three, the nine themes that are, that make sense from obviously from a Buddhist perspective at, at the three jewels. Uh, and, and I felt like with, with the three stages, this is where I'm trying to find people from different, you know, parts of their journey, or, you know, how they interpret the Dharma in the beginning of the practice and how I they like interpret that. the Dharma. Yeah. And so, so it's really to show the evolution of practice and, and again, show really, you know, hopefully people could get that sense of like, yeah, you know, just because you're in the beginning, you know, how you interpret the Dharma and how you integrate might look very different than at the end. What are the challenges at these different points in the journey? So that's kind of why I felt like breaking it up within the different stages of the development was be helpful because I feel like as you're starting out, the challenges are different. And then, you know, in the middle, it's like, okay, you know, it's about integration. It's about is there application, and so those were things that you know I was as I was going through in my own journey. I felt like okay, these are things that I'm grappling with in my journey. And I feel like that's how it's going to make, make it easier because it is a personal project in the sense of oh, it looking is. it through the lens of my own practice and seeing how 
my understanding of the Dharma matures through the, through the project. So I felt like it, that's why I wanted to be a long-term project. I wanted to kind of give it time to ferment and take shape and not sort of rush to finish it. Uh, and then obviously the three lineages, you know, the three different vehicles. And so this is where, again, uh, you know, because, again, it's, it sort of makes sense in terms of um, putting it in a way so that people could easily ex access sort of these things that, that, that they're aware I of. I yeah. like that. I like that on the website because I imagine that some people who were like just beginning would like to click on the beginning stages and see how other people were approaching that and, or how they did approach mm -hmm. that or in the middle stage or, you know, because it's it's kind of hard to identify if you're like a beginning practitioner. I, I think a uh, uh, I think a good part of my audience are beginning practitioners, mm -hmm. not all of them, so, but a good <laughs> part of my audience uh, are beginning practitioners because when they, they tend to come to a, a Buddhist podcast looking to understand Buddhism, right? I mean, that, that mm -hmm, makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I, but I imagine they think, well, I, you know, they wouldn't identify with somebody who's had a long-term practice because it would uh, just yeah. be an, another thing that's over their head, right? Because Buddhism is so yeah. complex to, um, I think Americans, <laughs> especially, and um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a very, you know, it's like, I mean, I, I you constantly get the question, why are there so many lists? You know, why are the, <laughs> da, 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 do I have to memorize all this? And it's like, you know, it's like, so it would, it, it's a wonderful thing to think that people could come and like identify with somebody right at the beginning. Right. And then, and then, you know, see that there are advanced people. So I like that. I like that decision. Um, do you, you already kind of hinted at this, but I'm, I'm going to dig deeper here. You, you, you know, mm -hmm. and I get what you're saying is like, you can't, you know, limited resources. You, you don't want to be redundant. You don't, you want to make sure that the stories are somewhat unique or that, mm -hmm. you know, hit a spot that, you know, is, that's different. Are there things that you're looking for now in your next subjects? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it, it, it's, it hasn't been covered. Cause I, I, I'm thinking, wow, if I thought of like 45 different Buddhist practitioners, I would think that a lot of it would be a lot. There'd be similar storylines. So yeah, uh, yeah. So there what, are definitely you, a lot of similar storylines, and I think you know, again, it's not going to be. I think for me, I think it's just it, it does. You know, obviously, I'm not sort of sort of institutions where I have to have sort of a form of action and include. Sort yeah, of right. from, you know, so, you know, I get it. I mean, I get that. You know, you know, in the West, you know, how Buddhism is practiced, has received, has a very dominant sort of class of people. You know, and so because and, 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 and I've been thinking about, again, really the way I'm going to sort of narrate the story, because in the book, it'll probably be more linear in terms of the narrative. The website, it's obviously um, a little more like choose your own adventure. <laughs> right. <laughs> but with, with, the, with, with the book, I feel like, you know, the reality of, you know, what it takes to have a committed practice. You know, again, I feel like given my own experience, given sort of the, the wealth of America and the resources that we do have and, and how do we, how do I appeal to, you know, the people that have the most opportunity in this precious life, you know, because obviously it's like, you know, and when we talk about when you don't have access to the Dharma and you're usually trying to survive, having a, a robust lay practice is very challenging. Now, obviously, in the East, Buddhism uh, and how the institutions have developed is going to be very different because, uh, you know, lay practice wasn't as robust in the East because, you know, you know the monks and the dana was, that was all, you know, been developed for a long time. But where in the West, you know, lay practice can be a lot more robust. Uh, and because, you know, we have the teachings we have the resources, you know, we have a lot more time being in, in sort of a richer, up, you know, uh, country that, you know, these are the people that can really have a robust practice. And so I am, you know, and so showing that having this practice and having, you know, the resources that we do have is something that I'm probably going to be more appealing to the people that have the opportunity. Because I was like going to retreats, taking time off, all these things require resources that, you know, even though we want to make the Dharma as accessible to anyone and anyone can benefit, whether they're from the prison or whatever, 
the reality is so you still having a robust practice means having more resources than you actually think. And so when I'm thinking about the narrative, um, you know, I feel like, okay, you know, how do I shape the narrative so that's going to serve, sort of pique the interest of the people that are, have sort of, because that's where I came from. I feel like, you know, when I talk to people, um, some of the teachers in the project, that's like, you know, the challenge of the West is how sticky our lifestyle is. No one wants to give up this good life mm-hmm. for spiritual practice because mm-hmm. it's like, you know, because obviously when you're struggling, when you're struggling and just barely getting by, you're like, there's gotta be more, there's more to life than just the struggle where when you're in a rich environment and I felt that that's how I was. I was like, I don't want to give this up. Why do I need to have a spiritual practice? I'm happy. I have all the resources I have, you know? And so that's really where for me, that's something that I've been thinking about more of really, you know, even though the project is going to be as comprehensive, it is as, as diverse as could be, how do I, when I get to the sort of, the narrative of the book, you know, how do I want to position like the people, the, the most of the people that can be sort of showcased? Yeah, you, but you know, in, in some in some ways, I think although I agree with what you're saying, but we'll push mm-hmm. back a little bit here is yeah. um, mm-hmm. um, is back when I first got into Buddhism because it, that that was in the late '80s, you know, or right. Um, so it's it's been quite a while, and and by and at that time, it, you really only did learn anything from some books. And um, going to teachings via sanghas or retreats, um, which did take, you know, money in most cases, or if you were going to be a member of of a sangha, then you would pay a membership fee to go to a retreat was all kind of pricey, probably, you know, not Mm -hmm. so much where I am in in, uh, Rochester, New York, but definitely um, in, uh, in other areas. But if it's like a big llama that was coming, then the the price went way up. (laughs) You you know what I mean? If you were going to get empowerment, it went way up. (laughs) And it it was like, but now I think the pushback here I have is that now I, Mm -hmm. there are many, many, many more in my experience, individual practitioners, Mm -hmm because of the availability of the practices on the internet. You know, back in the day when I was getting into it, you they wouldn't even give you like um, practices. Like they wouldn't list them in a book because you had to get them from mm-hmm. a teacher. Now you can find out anything you want about any practice on the internet. Almost, and you could you could try to do it yourself. I mean, if you wanted to, it's always best to do it with a teacher. But I <laughs> do experience a lot of people uh, sort of self initiating into Buddhism and then looking for um, uh, friends and sanghas afterwards. Do you see what I'm saying? No, I definitely appreciate where you're coming from because I think there's definitely you know in the people that I've interviewed, I think a lot of, a lot of people I interview have, you know, have, tend to be seekers and they're going to find regardless of what resources are available because it's sort of like, again, and, and I think for me, for me, and this has also been intentional with the book, which is obviously there are, you know, a lot of Asians that come from having a, you know, a Buddhist background from their family. And obviously, you know, there was a great book, Be the Refuge that came out recently that talked about that Asian experience right. where, you know, two thirds of the practitioners are Asians, but you wouldn't know that based on what mainstream Buddhism is showing. <laughs> yes, right? That's right. And so I think for me, yes, there's definitely uh, so many resources, you know, in this day and age with the internet, with the virtual sanghas that people can obviously enter the Dharma mindfulness, and again, all these things has ripened to the point where, yes, there's definitely a lot more resources in the past 10 years. And really, you know, this is where, again, part of the project is really to showcase, you know, what does a robust practice really look like? Because you can have mindfulness, you can have the teachings, but what about the practice? What, what's, what's the significance of a teacher? Why is this in the Sangha important? So I feel like as people are being more exposed to it through mindfulness, through all these things, I really, you know, being mindful of like, you know, the idea of giving people a sense of, okay, when you do have a teacher, when you do have a sangha, you, you know, the, the transformation and the power of the practice really shows up. 
Because it's not just about meditation practice. It's not just about the intellectual understanding, which, you know, again, I've, a lot of people are interested in Buddhism, but they don't practice. You know, so yeah. those are some <laughs> things that, you know, I want to really emphasize the idea that, yes, it, you know, we have so much access in this day and age from the teachings. But, you know, but I really want to focus on, you know, going beyond the meditation, going beyond sort of some of these things that, that, you know, I think the mainstream media has sort of pigeonholed what Buddhism might look like and really able to get deeper into people that are actually doing it, you know, not just sort of talking about it. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's, it, I'm, I'm always, I always call that like nightstand Buddhist, you know, that they have yeah. the, the, the stack of books. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people start there in the West and including yeah. myself. Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. then, and then, you know, and, 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 and it seems like you, you could get stuck there. Like you just keep going after mm -hmm. more into, I call it intellectual yeah. bling. You just keep going, mm -hmm. going more and more for the shiny objects of the intellect um, yes. without actually, without actually doing any practice. And if there is, you know, I, I tell my Sangha that I have my virtual Sangha, if practice is everything if it, you know you yeah. can you can read all you want but there mm -hmm. will be no transformation <laughs> of the mind unless yeah. you practice i mean truthfully mm -hmm. you, i mean you may have a few aha moments but mm -hmm. but i doubt if those aha moments will translate into something that you can take into your life that's why i call it everyday buddhism because yeah if, if yeah. you're not taking it into your everyday life it's it has no effect. I actually had a, a teacher tell me that that he would have people come to him and say, mm -hmm. I've been practicing Buddhism for 15, 20 years and not a thing has changed. I'm still a, <laughs> I'm still an angry person and these bad <laughs> things still keep happening. And then he would look at him and say, well, then you're not practicing because <laughs> yeah. that's really that's really it. I mean, because you said um, one of the things uh, you said it is an invitation to witness the transformative power of a spiritual practice in a world full of suffering and conflict. So I'm going to ask you now, obviously mm -hmm. you don't name <laughs> names or anything. I get that. Um, but is there, are there any stories of practitioners that you can share where you saw a transformation that either either surprised you based on what you know from your own personal journey or excited you from something that you learned from them from their transformation. Does this make any sense? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And this is where I think for me being personal too, is like, I've really enjoyed some of the conversations I've had with people that have been practicing for 30 years. I think it's, it's a preview of what's to come. And I felt like, having the opportunity to learn to listen to these people that have been practicing for 30 years has been really again you know really giving me strength in the in, in, in really the idea of that how powerful the practice could be uh yeah for one example um there's this practitioner um you know that was based in colorado and she was you know she had been uh practicing you know for a long time and she talked about her experience uh, being uh, disabled, uh, experiencing death, and how uh, the practice has really sustained her through these sort of very typical challenges. You know, whether um, they had this one practitioner, she had cancer when she was in her three-year retreat, and her relationship with cancer was like, I wasn't suffering. And, and seeing, seeing how people talk about so when we talk about suffering and how our relationship with suffering, whether it's cancer or where it's being disabled, being in a wheelchair for 10 years and able to sustain their practice and use their practice to transform the suffering into a place of equanimity and joy was really powerful for me. And so yeah. those were some examples that really stood out, you know, anytime, you know, cause you know, I, you know, I watched some documentaries recently about Garjan Rinpoche and he talked about his time in the prison. He was one and, of my you know, teachers. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, so there's a, you know, I just saw that documentary for all the, you know, for, for the benefit, for the benefit of all beings. beings. Yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah. And I was just like, yes, you know, being an amazing teacher, you hear how he uses his practice in prison to really change that reality. But also again, seeing that type of transformation, seeing that type of 
practice in ordinary people in day to day life really gave me that confidence of yeah this is something that is that is transformative it's not just sort of not exclusive to the high lama it's not exclusive to people that are in you know in monasteries that have us been practicing for a long time and so for me that was some of the stories that really stood out to me in terms of how do you apply emptiness in the setting and how do you <laughs> have compassion you know, for these people that have been very challenging. So those are some of the things that really stood out for me. Yeah. Yeah, that's excellent. And, and Garchin Rinpoche, uh, his eminence, he was one of my <laughs> teachers and uh, yeah. uh, um, yeah. his story, he had so many wonderful off the cuff stories of the time in the prison. And when you mm -hmm. would look at his face, when he told the story, especially in person, there was never you know, there was, there was, it wasn't a facade of, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean, it wasn't mm -hmm. a facade of being, uh, coming to terms and, and seeing the Chinese with equanimity. Mm -hmm. There was no facade. It was true. It yeah. was real. It was definitely real. Yeah. And, and the stories he would tell, like the, there's one, and I don't know if that's in the movie or not. Um, I can't remember mm -hmm. the documentary where he would t talk about, he mm -hmm. had one of his prison mates was, a. Uh, uh, is Islam practiced Islam and mm. so would have to pray um, mm -hmm. um, multiple times a day. So um, he, he would all make sure that he would look out um, and got mm. and guard the, the door um, to alert uh, his, his uh, Islam, Muslim brother there um mm -hmm. that maybe the guards were coming to allow him to pray and he would help him pray every single day um mm -hmm. to, and mm -hmm. keep the keep the guards from finding out because that was not something you were supposed to do yeah uh mm -hmm. and he was uh and to get real personal here he was a, a practice that he gave us that completely mm -hmm. changed my life um mm -hmm. uh, uh speaking of transformation and i have shared it with my sangha and it's changed their lives they tell me is something mm -hmm. called and i don't know if you're familiar with this little book since you're a tibetan practitioner now the 37 practices of bodhisattvas <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah um this little book he gave this to me um and he he when he goes to a teaching he has his prayer wheel in one and he hands out these little books in another in yeah. the other hand uh, everywhere he goes just an amazing mm -hmm. amazing llama um so mm -hmm. yeah yeah um i liked what you said about how do you apply emptiness in your every day that's a pretty <laughs> big subject and i think it would stop most people um but 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 yeah that's uh, what a great question to ask a practitioner how do you apply emptiness yeah. in your every day cuz i remember um, you know, emptiness is a big subject to tackle. And some people mm -hmm. it's, it's like a mind blowing thing for a lot of people if they've never dealt with it. But, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I remember, um, in my sangha that finally made them all click was, uh, was I said, emptiness is absolutely wonderful because it makes all things possible. Without emptiness, nothing at all is possible. <laughs> and then they were like, huh, you know. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, those are those are great questions. How do you come up with your questions? Oh, you said you were trying to use the three the 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 yeah. nine nine areas, right? Sure. I mean, I do have sort of I mean, I do have nine main big themes, but within each theme I have you know, sort of standard questions that, you know, that are laid around the journey, like how do you discover Buddhism? What are your pra daily practices? And so, you know, and so I do have a set of questions that are sort of I share with people and say, hey, these are some of the themes we could explore, but really your, your experience is going to be unique. And I kind of take the, their, their cue in the interview in terms of, okay, what's going to be more interesting? Because really, you know, there's the, there's you know there's definitely the sort of logistics of practice, but also you know for me, you know what is more compelling is really sort of the heartwarming stories that they share. I think that's really yeah, you know, and when they share, those are going to be more compelling than like okay, I practice the Dharma and I took and, and this is how I yeah, and so yeah. I, you know I try to stay away from sort of 
sort of didactic Dharma discussions. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because because yeah. <laughs> there's I guess that that's the danger of, of interviewing teachers. You know, for a while. I wasn't interviewing <laughs> teachers because I was like, okay, I'll get a lecture. <laughs> but, but eventually I felt like I had to just because otherwise it's going to be too, too, that's all. But yeah, so again, so a lot of times I kind of have a structure to kind of, okay, look at this document, see which themes are relevant to your personal experience. Because some people never gone to retreat. Some people haven't tech reference with a teacher. And so I kind of leave it so that, there is a basis of like ways to explore, you know, guide the conversation, but at the same time, leave it up to what also is really, what, what are they passionate about and what their personal journey looks like? What, um, and I know this isn't a scientific study or your, you yeah, so, no, it's not. <laughs> so, so we'll take the, we'll take the, uh, the, the, you know, we will, we won't take any blame for this, but a question I have is um, um, in all these practitioners, is there like a, a, a typical practice, you know, it's like, is it mostly meditation? Is it mostly prayers or, or a morning practice? Like, you know, in, in, uh, uh, sadhana practices that you get when you're in tibetan buddhism um i know you're doing nundro um i that was how i end up leaving tibetan buddhism was in the midst mm -hmm. of my nundro <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it kind of pushed me the other way no um my 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 director my yeah. sangha director said the, uh -huh. that that was the the ripening of my karma the nundra <laughs> ripened my karma and showed me that i wasn't supposed to be practicing tibetan buddhism after all yeah. <laughs> so, all right <laughs> yeah. so i was like oh boy no i'm not really nundra is a tough practice so good luck um but <laughs> but but anyway um is there is there you more, more common than another or is it all across the yeah, I mean, like I said, this is one of the people I talked to before I started the project was Anne Gleed. I think she wrote a book about sort of Buddhism in the West that came out recently. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and she talked about the, some of the trends that she saw as a, from a sort of academic point of view. And I had a conversation with her and she's like, okay, you know, if you can do something like this, these are some of the things I suggest. And, and I think for me, and, and it's relevant too, I think it's really because I think right now, with mindfulness as a, as the trend, meditation being very sort of very associated with Buddhism, she said, "Look, you know, make sure you include a lot more practices in terms of what chanting, what the mantras." And right. so, I really have really asked people about beyond meditation, what are you doing on a daily basis? You know, how are you doing the mind training? What's the point of visualization? So, yeah, so I definitely have. Uh, been more dominant in asking people around these different practices because, like I said, I want to really expose you know people that are curious that look, it's not just about meditation because that's where I was stuck at for a long time in my practice. That's all I did, and it's like it was great in terms of my health and like my well being, but I wasn't doing any mind training. I wasn't integrating sort of these thoughts. I wasn't contemplating, and so. And so that's kind of, and so I've been trying to focus on some of these other components of the Buddha Dharma that, again, people are less, uh, you know, that's less known in terms of what does a robust practice look like. And so those were, I think, some of the things that I've been fo more focused on, Wendy. Yeah. 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 That's it. In my Sangha, we, I, since I have experience in both Tibetan Buddhism and Pure Land mm -hmm. or, or Jodo Shinshu Buddhism and some Zen Buddhism, because all of those are influences mm -hmm. by my, my current teacher, my Mahayana teacher, uh, my current mm -hmm. teacher from um, Japanese Buddhism, who just passed away um, in March. And so mm -hmm. we lost him, but um, he, one of the things that I do is I like to expose people to to text for across the traditions because everybody mm -hmm. thinks it's either mindfulness or meditation. And then when you mm -hmm. when I've done, you know, the 37 practices or expose them to Lojong, for example, mm -hmm. um, it's like mind blowing mm -hmm. to people um, <laughs> because it really does have ways to expand your mind. And a lot of people don't even know that there are whole buddhist practices that have nothing to do with meditation like tradition yeah, yeah. traditional traditional uh pure land 
practices um, <laughs> are um, tr- uh, they, it's just the chanting of the nambutsu, mm-hmm. uh, namo minabutsu, mm-hmm. which is um, or or uh, other sutras without. Um, meditation and and even in Jodo yeah. Shin, mm-hmm. Jodo Shinsu, we mm-hmm. they, they're um, th- one of the main practices is called listening, where you listen mm-hmm. or you 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 are aware of the Dharma in everyday life, which is one of the th- primary mm-hmm. teachings I got from my teacher, which is what I like to teach, is because mm-hmm. I think it's very important. That's one way of no matter how much you read, no matter how much you practice, if you're not listening, if you're, then you can incorporate it in your everyday mm-hmm, life. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad you're, exp- you know, branching out and exposing people um, to all these other wonderful practices in the Buddha Dharma. So that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, I was uh, um, transcribing a, an interview yesterday and then and the, the person I was interviewing, I mentioned Joseph Gosteen's One Dharma book. And as I looked it up, it, yeah, this is totally like the idea of like, again, in the West, you know, you know, you, even though we have all these different lineages, I think the one, one of the things, the themes I want to, to, to kind of hopefully share in the book is really, it doesn't matter what these lineages are, or even calling yourself a Buddhist. It's like, again, the idea that these practices, you know, whether, uh, you know, beyond meditation can be beneficial to whatever lineage, you, whatever you know, you know, religion you're part of, whatever lineage you do. So it just comes back to about being practicing and being aware, and so not get too caught up being uh, being a Buddhist or being in a certain lineage, right? Because <laughs> hopefully, you know, in the book, he's like, okay, you, you know, I, you know, right now the website, you know, had people categorized, but that's just another way of separating. It doesn't matter, right? And so, so hopefully, that's something that I could really put together in terms of really showing that. You know, even someone from a very different lineage and the way they talk about their motivation of what does, how does the Bodhisattva vow look like in the, the Jodo Shindu tradition. And the, even though the language is different, the energy that people talk about, why they're motivated to do that, whether it's in the, the Ben tradition, I hope that something, some that people can pick it up that again, you know, even though the language and these li- uh, lineages might seem different, the, mo- the energy and the motivation is fairly consistent as I kind of, you know, interview people say, like, oh, yeah, this, yeah, for the benefit of all Asian beings, right? And so it's sort of like, it just, and, and you know, I, I interview a war veteran and he's like, I, the way I look at it is leave no man behind, you know, it's sort of like, like yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you talk about the 47 valve, you know, so it's like, yes, this is what, this is what this is about, which is, yeah, you know, you have uh, the richness of the Buddhist Dharma that it can work with anybody you know, 84,000 teachings. So, you know, whatever religion you practice, whatever the things, there are practices that work with your personality, work with your capacity. And so not to get, and so there's a lot more flexibility than people think in terms of like, you know, they think Buddhism is so monolithic in terms yeah. of what that might look like. And so I think this is where it's important for me to have people from these sort of lesser known lineages that talk about their experiences about that. Yeah. That's all. That's awesome. And, 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 and there's also the evolution factor, and this is, it's a good way for us to end, but you were talking about one of the things that you were, you, you know, that the beginning, middle and end is like, you were, you're part of like letting this project even ferment while you're in the middle of it is because Mm -hmm. you're evolving as you go through your path. And one of the mm-hmm. things I've been blown away by myself is mm-hmm. um, I'm almost 70 years old and I, and I started in my forties and, yeah. and, and it's, so it's like, um, I can't believe how, how, how many different phases I've gone through and different things in my life and different major upsets and transformations. And, and I, I've sort of dragged the Buddha Dharma with me all along. <laughs> and, 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 and yet when I look back, it's like, there was a time I like, I was just uh, hinting at when Nundro, mm-hmm. I, I left the Tibetan Buddhism during <laughs> Nundro is when I, I, I thought, well, it's like, if I never hear another Tibetan thing in a while, in a while it'll, it'll be too early. And then now I can't get, I always keep bringing it's it's so much a part of me that i bring mm-hmm. it into everything else that i've learned mm-hmm. and so it is if you 
if you have the benefit of living long enough to bring your practice along with you for 30 some years, you will be mm-hmm. amazed how it is one Dharma. It all, it is one flavor, no matter in what way mm-hmm. you practice it. Yeah. Yeah. I hopefully that's what I'm saying. I think one of the things that's also been amazing is that like, as you, as you interview people at different stages of their practice, it's like, it's not about these advanced practices, really. And it's amazing well, how they talk, oh, yeah, you know, I use Tang Lin in prison. I was like, wow, I love to use this Tang Lin, you know. And so it just, again, shows the power of these, you know, these simple, but, you know, pr- simple practices that you don't need to go to all these crazy empowerments, all these sort of esoteric things to really have a transformative exp- experience, you know, to transform life. And so, yeah, it's, like you said, it's sort of like seeing that and able to hear that from people that have been 30, 30 years, like, wow, it's so simple. You know, Alan Wallace's <laughs> practice is a form of me- immeasurable. It's okay. You know, I have access to that, right? So it's sort of like, um, yeah. And so like I said, I think those were, you know, when we first start out, there's this spiritual materialism of like, <laughs> yeah. yes, go to as much as possible. And now it's like, okay, I'm just really starting very basic in the new year. It's like, focus on refuge in Bodhicitta. That's all you need to do. And so it's, like I said, like I said, I think, all those ingredients are in other lineages. And so it's just amazing where, you know, as, as I'm doing this interview and, and educating myself, I was like, yeah, this is amazing because it's, I'm seeing that firsthand, what it means to, to have, uh, to see, you know, different people from different social economic classes, different lineages talk about the Buddha Dharma in a way that obviously I appreciate just because, again, I having some knowledge of it. Oh, wow, this is all sounds very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it's they're using somewhat different words, it exactly. does sound the same. Well, or if you read exactly. different practices or different prayers, you get you get mm-hmm. the sense of everything that you've ever practiced in whatever lineage you were in. Yeah. So absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I think it's a great way to end. I think this it's it's all one flavor, right? It's all one <laughs> yeah. flavor. And one and taste, uh, yeah. I encourage everyone to to check out i know you're not necessarily looking for people so i, just, I am i actually am you are? that's what i'm saying yeah that's what i'm saying i'm at halfway there and if people are interested in participating i am still looking for people that's what i'm saying i'm just gonna be a little more discriminating in terms of you know because i am open to everybody in the u.s because i travel for my own professional work and so, yeah, I am still trying to get to okay. 108. So I am still looking for 108. Just, wait, wait. Not- <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. Yeah. We got to get to that 108. So, yeah, I, I do. I do want to encourage people then to go to Beyond the Cushion. And I'll, ha- I'll put the link in, in the show notes. It's Is it dot .com or dot .org? I forget. Uh, I think it's dot .com, yeah. You can't remember either. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <it was> <laughs> <laughs> so beyondthecushion.com, you will you will just be mesmerized. It was one of those things. It was kind of a down the rabbit hole adventure for me. Uh, <laughs> once I once I got into it, I just kept clicking on another person and another person and another person, and it was so fascinating. So no matter what, if just do it for that purpose, and it really will educate you. And and another thing, if you're interested in in being a subject quote unquote um uh, jack has a uh questionnaire or something on his on his website that you can fill out and i'm sure you'll get back to them about whether you're interested or not and so yeah. that's that's just great jack thank you for your time today thank you for uh educating us on this project i it's the most fascinating thing in the world and i can't believe no one's ever done it but you are a very original <laughs> guy uh, <laughs> is there anything so really is there anything else you'd like to say that i didn't ask or that you'd like to mention um i don't think so i think we cover a lot so i just really appreciate your time for it and, and able to then share this project because again i think it's uh hopefully it can be benefit of, for other people That's it will be for the benefit part. of all yeah. beings yeah <laughs> thank you have a good day thank you yeah. so much Wendy. that's it for this episode as i mentioned in the episode jack's vision and mission is truly unique and a wonderful contribution to buddhist literature and media through a visual study of buddhism in the west as felt and lived through the lens of lay practitioners. It is a wonderful resource for people interested or engaged in Buddhist practice as lay people, 
and as a primer to demystify Buddhist practice for people with little knowledge about the subject. Check out beyondthecushion.com. I will post the link in the show notes. Next up, some announcements. Don't forget that you can join me and others in the private donation-supported Everyday Sangha that meets virtually via Zoom every other week on Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time. The Sangha is currently at the end of our study of the Diamond Sutra, and we will soon be starting a new format and new book study. I will look for the announcements about that new format and new book study if you follow Everyday Buddhism or me, Wendy Shinyo Halet, on any of our social media presences. So, and please consider supporting the efforts of this podcast and related groups by becoming a community member for $5 a month. If you do, you will have access to blogs, members-only podcasts, an education series, a private Facebook group, the Introduction to Buddhism course, and the new bonus contemplation podcasts. Now, if you don't follow me or Everyday Buddhism on any of our social media platforms we post in, you can go to the Everyday Buddhism website and join the membership community or the Everyday Sangha. Go to www dot everyday dash buddhism dot com and click on the tab that says join community or sangha. I can't stress enough how thankful I am to those of you who donate or join our groups. Since I do not seek podcast sponsors and do not ask for financial commitments through paid podcast memberships, my work and the cost of the infrastructure needed to support what I do is entirely self-funded except for your dona- your donations. So thanks too to all of you who write in with comments and questions. I do read everything, but I can't always respond. But another way you can help is to rate and review the podcast on your favorite podcast platform. It's important to share this podcast with others if you find it helpful in your life. And if you could, take a minute to comment so people will know why you love everyday Buddhism. And that's all for the announcements. And that's all until next time. Keep finding ways to make yours and everyone's days better. 